Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll do a quick uh, historical overview just to make sure we're all on the same page. And I'm going to start with a case study because I think uh, seeing an actual example is usually the best way to get into, into a topic. Then I'm going to go over the main features of the SD tuple. Uh, not all of them, because even though it's a relatively small data structure, there's still too much of it to be covered in just one go. Uh, all this is going to be fairly introductory uh, level stuff. Then I'm going to discuss a little bit about the limitations, and then there's going to be something that is a little bit more advanced, not a whole lot more. And I'm going to end by uh, doing some honorable mentions, really covering the other features of SDD Topo that I'm not really going to discuss, but I just want to acknowledge that they exist. Okay. Uh, and please uh, let me know at any time if there are any questions or comments during the lecture. All right, so let's get started. So uh, a tuple is basically a, a zero or more elements, uh, potentially of different types and uh, something just came up. Um, and uh, it understandably can be thought of as a sort of a generalization of SDD pair. If a pair is just two elements in an or, in an orderly fashion, a tuple is any given number of elements, any given number but fixed uh, elements in a particular order. And it has been done using variadic templates, essentially. Um, it was introduced along with several helpers in C11. There have been some enhancements in C14. Hey, honey, are you mad at me? Not at all. What are you, are you, what are you, are you watching something or? Need to upload. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. Sorry. Yeah, I'm good. Come and. Watch TV or oh, that's very nice, babe. That's very nice of you. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, there have been a small enhancement in C plus plus fourteen and some more uh, uh, enhancement in C plus plus seventeen. I'm still working my way through C20, but I have not seen any significant changes in C20. I think it's a bit of a shame because there's still a lot more that can be done uh, with this uh, data structure. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start with the case study. And the case study that I want to present is what happens when I have uh, some sort of uh, function or method uh, named query. And when invoking that query, there are a couple of things that I want to know as a result of that. The first of all is I want to know what the answer to the query, what response did I get? Uh, but on top of that, I want to know who gave me that response. Uh, this is a situation, for example, when I want to query, send a query uh, to the internet and there are many entities out there that can potentially give me an answer. I want to know which of them is the one that actually answered my question. And on top of that, I also want to get some statistical information about how long it took, uh, how many attempts were made in the process. Maybe I'm doing retries if I, if I can't make it the first time and so on and so forth. So th those are three things that I want to know as a result from invoking the query, which gives me a sort of a problem because there is some sort of mismatch. While a functional method can get many parameters, it can only return one value. This is something that I know personally bothered me when I first started to learn C and people told me, don't worry about it. Here's a case when we actually do want to, uh, to worry about it. And the question now we are facing is, how do we turn one output into three? And there are several ways to do that, but I think that generally we can categorize them in 
three major uh, types of families of solutions. Uh, the first one is output parameters. This is very common in C. We actually give a function a parameter that tells her where to save the output. Uh, that's, a, that's one option. The second option is to have some sort of side effect. So when I invoke the function, I get the output, but also something else outside of the function changes. Maybe a value is saved to a global variable, maybe something else but some sort of side effects takes, takes place. And of course, the third option is to wrap several elements in a container. And then I have one container that actually contains all three of the elements that I want to, to do. And there are pros and cons to each of these uh, approaches, but the thing that I know bothers me particularly when I look at code is what, how do we handle failures? And the main problem both in the first and second kinds of problems is there is no intuitive way to know what happened to the output if a function failed. Were the output parameters already set or not? Uh, were side effects already taken place or not? Uh, and uh, the third option is much simpler in that um, I get the all three of the elements at the same time. And the way I want to do this is using, of course, a tuple. So let's look at a template of the solution. Um, I have my query. I want to return a tuple of all uh, uh, of all three uh, elements. So I have the answer, the source and the stats, and then I, I work, do some sort of calculation, I get a result, and then I return a tuple of those three elements. Um, the uh, last uh, line is a, is, is a bit of a mouthful, so the, fortunately we can reduce that and you, use uh, a make tuple, which essentially does the same thing, calls the constructor, and it uses uh, a template uh, parameter deduction in order to uh, simplify the code greatly. Okay, so that's the uh, callee. Uh, let's look at the caller. So the caller, of course, uh, receives the tuple as a response. Uh, and um, then we can use the elements in the tuple. How do we use, how do we do that? Uh, we have a, a parameter, uh, we have a function called get that takes as a template parameter the number of the element that we want to get from the tuple. Um, and so in this case, I want the uh, second uh, element, which is number one, because we're using zero base, of course. Uh, we want to get the source and apply some sort of um, function or method from that source. Uh, this is very unreadable, as I think most of you will agree. Uh, and a suggestion would be to simplify it like this and have a reference at the beginning of the function and then you can know that this is a source that you get from the, uh, from the uh, query and you can use the source uh, simply as that. Uh, assigning a, a lot of element this way is a bit complicated. There is a way to simplify that as well. So here we have a solution. This is very close to what we actually do in practice. I have my three uh, elements. I tie them together and I save the information. What tie does is essentially creates a tuple of references. So it's a tuple of reference to answer source and stats. And when I assign to the tuple, really the, uh, the values of the, uh, of the original tuple are saved to the different uh, variables that I have. Um, this, is, this is almost perfect. Uh, in fact, it's sometimes actually the best you can get if you are using the same way that we do, in which 
you do a try catch section and you want to assign the uh, uh, values, uh, uh, a, a default values in, catch, in case of an error. Uh, but in general, uh, the, the downside is that it breaks uh, RIAI. So we first define the elements and we really only assign, initialize them uh, in, uh, uh, in the tie section. So it's almost great, but if you're using C++17, as I see already people uh, commenting in the, uh, uh, in the chat box, then you have uh, uh, constructable uh, uh, variables and you can use uh, uh, structured binding and you can use this, this also works with movable types. Sorry? This also works with move only types. Yes. Uh, and uh, that, that is uh, that is really, uh, as a Python user, that is the best that you, that is exactly what you want. It allows you to define the, the, the define and initialize the value of all all of, all, at, all the all the variables at once and easily and easily uh, done in one line. So uh, that's great, uh, and, and that's really what we do most of the time in our code. Um, and the first, and the question is, if this is actually so wonderful, why did we wait until C plus plus eleven to get this? And the answer is that we sort of had something like a tuple uh, beforehand. Uh, really a collection of, uh, of elements is the same as saying a struct. That's what a struct is, is a collection of uh, different elements. And there is very uh, little difference in some sense between saying I have a tuple of three elements and I have a struct of three elements. Uh, but there are a few differences uh, that uh, I think we should discuss. And I think that the most important one for me is semantics. When we work in C++, we want to work or to think of things as objects. So when I see a struct or a class, I want to think of an object. Um, a struct or a class that doesn't have any methods or have only get, trivial getters and setters uh, does something wrong, doesn't really represent an object in the system. So if we are using structs uh, in such a way, we in some sense abuse it. Now, it's obviously not globally correct. Uh, for example, if you are working very low level and you want to uh, pass uh, a packet and read the IP headers, then what you do is you have a struct and you cast the pointer to the struct and then you can read the IP headers in a reasonable way. Yes, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, I don't want to create a lot of structs and a lot of objects that are not really objects. That are the only purpose that they serve is to um, to pass data from one place to the other. So that's the most important to me. Another element uh, that is very important is standardization. Uh, in this track, for example, I used uh, first, second, and third, just to make it look a little more like a tuple, but I could also go in with one, two, three, or more likely answer source and start to give it uh, more meaningful names. The problem is if I want to use, say, a template that receives a sort of a query, a generalized query, and want to, uh, uh, to work with the output that I get, then I have no way of really enforcing that all the structures would be in the same form, which is necessary if I want to place them into a, in all of them into a template. Tuple, on the other hand, uh, I know that is going to be accessed using the same way of the get method. So I can uh, use the, know that I can use the, all the inputs in the same way and that is very useful when I want to use templates, for example. Uh, um, a point that is neither here nor there is the fact that uh, tuple encouraged me to do more of a strict ordering. Um, 
you'd be hard pressed to, when you look at the struct, to say which should come first, the answer, the source, or the stat. We don't usually, uh, for the most part, unless we are really interested in the ABI on the underlying uh, binary uh, format of the structure. Uh, Uh, to make it uh, 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 to consider that as as, as, a, as a something that we should really pay attention to in terms of semantic. On the top of, on the other hand, since things are ordered and since we tend to place more importance on the first elements, uh, it's very clear that answer is the most important one, so it should be first, and start is the least important one, so it should be last. So. Uh, that's something that uh, I find help me, at least, in understanding the code. Um, but it's neither here nor there. And there is one last point that is actually a little bit in favor of the structure. Uh, um, and that is the memory consumption. Uh, Topol has a very low overhead of a struct, but a very low overhead does not mean no overhead at all. So if you're in a situation in which you're really strict on memory and you're counting each and every byte, uh, a tuple might not be the solution uh, for you. And I see somebody ask if you can uh, uh, use some sort of type def. The answer is yes, definitely. And people already said uh, answer that in the chat as well. All right. So to answer the why, how, and when, uh, so my answer to when would be when you are facing with a trivial structure that you're not really using as an, as an object or, uh, uh, or in, a, in a sophisticated way, then a tuple might be a good way to indicate that. Um, how we just saw the, uh, the elements uh, uh, in questions and it's, uh, uh, and why? My two answers to why is, first of all, the semantics and, uh, and the standardization, which since I really like to place things in the templates is really important to me. So that's the case study that should give us some sense of how a tuple can, uh, can be used and that is how we in practice often use it. Uh, so let's, uh, we've covered most of what we have to do in terms of uh, the usage itself, but let's look at the, uh, uh, at the um, actual uh, definitions. So a tuple has a very sparse uh, interface to it. It has a constructor, actually 18 kinds of constructors because you can construct in addition to the move and copy constructors and various other constructors, you can also construct them from, from a pair and from a, a, a lots of, a, a, so that also creates a lot of variations, but they're all very, fairly simple. It have assignments similar to the construction and it has swap, uh, which also exists as, a, as an external function. So instead of writing uh, t1.swap t2, you can write swap t1, uh, comma t2, which is uh, slightly nice looking nicer, uh, but it's the same thing that actually calls the one calls the other. Uh, and uh, since uh, c plus 20, those are cons expressions uh, as well. Uh, there are no other uh, uh, methods to this class, there are no other types. Uh, not even, uh, there are no iterators, for example, so all of the uh, um, uh, STD functions or uh, other algorithms that the language has will not work with Tuple. And we'll see uh, a little later on why that is. Uh, so, so thanks, because of the, thanks uh, to the uh, standard library, we do have some other uh, external functions that helps us uh, to accomplish things more clearly. Uh, we've seen most of them. Uh, the, uh, the make tuple uh, uh, takes, uh, allows us to invoke the constructors more easily. Uh, 
Tai is again invoking a constructor, but instead of uh, invoking, but does so by invoking a, ref a constructor of references rather than a constructor of the elements. Uh, get uh, takes, uh, returns one element from the tuple, and you can compare tuples uh, uh, using equals and not equal and all the regular operators that you know. And the only thing to comment about that is since C20 changed the comparison operators that it applies to tuple as well. But um, it's a great way to do lexicographical. Sorry? It's a lexicographical comparison in the origin. Yes. Yes. So uh, the, the, uh, that, that thing is a very interesting topic, but it's a little bit of outside of the scope of the lexical uh, sorting that the C introduced. Um, okay, so uh, we do need to say a few more words about the STD get. Uh, we saw one version of it uh, in which uh, we get a template on, which is templated on a number and a tuple, and we get the IF position in the tuple. That is the uh, version that we saw. Since uh, C14, we actually have a, a different uh, version as well, in which we get a type specific type and the types of the uh, tuple, and it returns the only instance of that type in the tuple. It's very important. There has to be only one kind of that uh, type in the tuple or compilation will fail. And uh, this was how it, this is what it looks like. And you can see why the, this is an improvement of the code that I see uh, wrote uh, previously, because when we uh, when you see get zero, it's very hard to understand exactly what you're getting out of the tuple. When you see get by the type, it's very easy to understand what you get on the tuple. So it's uh, very nice, uh, and it's the major improvement that C++14 introduced into tuple. It makes the code uh, uh, much more easy to use and much more readable. Um, which still leads to the uh, okay. Well, I think I forgot to say that, but we should. Uh, we haven't encountered a tuple size, but we will in a moment. So uh, should uh, uh, introduce us. Uh, really, it's a helper structure that uh, is templated on a tuple, and what it generates is the size of the tuple. Uh, basically, it inherits from us the uh, integral constant. I don't know why there are unnecessary spaces that were in the, the code here, but uh, uh, but they shouldn't. It has a, a static uh, member called value. Uh, really all the members and types are inherited from uh, integral constant mostly. Um, and uh, in C17, uh, we had a, a helper definition in which we can use a tuple size V uh, and that really evaluates to the tuple size of value and it's just uh, easier to read, to, to read and understand. Uh, okay, so why aren't we working with tuples more? Uh, let's uh, use, uh, let's look at a simple example. Um, I want to print the tuple that I got mostly for debugging purposes. I want to see that I got the response that I, that I expected to get. So intuitively, I would have liked to write something like this. Uh, for element in tuple, print out the element. That's the easiest things to do. And that would have worked with pretty much any container, except uh, it wouldn't work with tuple because this assumes that we have begin and end and iterators in general, and uh, tuple doesn't have iterators. So we can do that. Well. Uh, we've had uh, loops before we had iterators. So let's try and, uh, uh, and rewrite the code. So uh, now I need the uh, tuple size that I decided to describe before to get the size of the tuple. And I want to iterate from zero to the size of the tuple and use get uh, uh, on, the, on the tuple. And I'm sure some of you are already uh, pointing out that this code can't possibly work because uh, i is a, is a variable here and not known at compilation time, which we need to uh, 
to do if we want to, uh, to work with the code. But actually there's a bigger problem and that is we don't know what type get will return to us. Uh, it could be a string, it could be a, a float, it could be a string, it could be anything that the, that the tuple presents. And since tuple represents different types, this could be, this will almost certainly be evaluated into different types, but the code needs to know uh, what type it will be to, to generate the, uh, the correct inspection set. And uh, that means we can't really uh, iterate easily uh, over, uh, uh, over tuples in the same way that we do other containers because uh, we don't know what types we're going to get. And that is the big difference between C++ and, and Python. C++ is very ty strictly typed, whereas Python isn't. And that creates this really big difference uh, in the use. Fortunately, every loop can be turned into a recursion. And when we use a recursion, we can use different functions in the recursion for every steps. And so that's, what, that's how we're going to solve this specific problem. Um, so I'm going to turn the uh, uh, loop into uh, a recursion. So this is a structure that represents the, the recursion. There's gonna be some sort of callable object that I want to call each iteration. And what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to start from the end and I'm keep going backward, backward, backwards. And, I'm, uh, and since this is a forward iteration, I'm first going backwards and then in, and, and only afterwards uh, represent, uh, activate the function. I could have switched the, uh, uh, forward, the, the two lines in the invoke and then I would have gone, and then I would have gotten a backwards uh, loop, starting from the end and going to the beginning. Uh, and basically I want to uh, invoke the, uh, fun, uh, the uh, callable object with every uh, element of the uh, tuple one at a time um, according to order. And, and by the way, I'm dropping the STD uh, prefix uh, uh, at each step uh, just for, uh, to keep the code a little bit shorter. So this is the recursion. I also, of course, need a, a terminating condition. So I'm going to have the specialization. If the length of the tuple is zero, then there is nothing to call. That will terminate the, the recursion. And, uh, um, and I am going, now I have the recursion, I'm going to wrap it up uh, very nicely with the, uh, with a function that will serve as my for loop. What it's going to do is to get the callable object and really invoke, use, creates the object that implements, uh, uh, implements the recursion and invoke the, the call. I'm also going to use some syntactic sugar and uh, Create, since most of the time the callable object is going to be created specifically for the uh, invocation, uh, this is going to be uh, a nice uh, syntactic sugar to create the object and use it all in one go. Um, and see some comments. Yes, exactly, it's a compile time recursion. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, let's uh, look at example. So I've created a, a print extract that basically uh, is a callable object. And, it, uh, and the important thing about it is that uh, it has, uh, it can work with any type of, uh, of printable uh, environment. So this uh, template will catch, of course, both integers and strings. And you can see, in, in, I have an example here of creating a tuple of different types, uh, 17, 3.14, and my Sharona, and I can iterate printer over my tuple, and I will get exactly what I want, uh, 17, 3.14, and my Sharona. 
So that's nice. And I want to show just one more example because uh, it will really show a little bit how, my, how this uh, uh, um, this approach can be used. Before we had a very simple uh, uh, printer. Now I want something a little nicer. So I have a pretty printer, which will uh, list all the elements uh, in line, it has a, a, a Boolean that tells it whether or not this is the first element. If it's not the first element, then we should add a comma to separate between uh, uh, different uh, elements. Uh, I see uh, people want me to use uh, uh, slash n instead of, uh, of end line. Actually, I don't technically uh, end is over slash n is, over, is an overkill. Uh, we don't necessarily want to uh, terminate the line when we print the uh, 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 the uh, element. But for the test example that I used, I, I placed the end uh, end line here. But you're right; uh, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, need to do. And when I run this code again, uh, uh, this is the output that I get. So uh, this means that I can. Uh, use the, uh, this is a demonstration of uh, how I can use the loop to do uh, something uh, more uh, complicated uh, than, uh, uh, than usual. Um, um, okay, and obviously this is just the beginning. Uh, there are a lot of elements here that, uh, that I skipped that we can consider. For example, uh, most of this code uh, is not, uh, that there are consts element that should, that I've dropped that we can discuss whether or not they should be there. Uh, the element, there are elements of the pretty printer. Uh, you can ask why do I need an instance of the pretty printer? Why not make the uh, template statics and then I don't need an instance, for example, uh, and, uh, um, and so on and so forth. This is just to uh, suggest what we can do. And once we have the uh, ability to loop over the uh, uh, the tuple, only then we can actually go and start making more advanced usage uh, of the uh, of the tuple and really implement all the algorithms that we usually work with when we have uh, our containers of various kinds. Uh, so that's my answer of why we don't use tuple more. The standard template library does not provide uh, the kind of uh, access mechanisms that will facilitate working with the, uh, uh, the uh, elements. I am nearly done. I do have the honorable mention section yet. Uh, so let's look at that. Uh, so there are a couple of things that I didn't uh, include because I figured uh, um, discussing them is uh, really uh, need to Add a lot more time to the uh, talk than it already has. Uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, classes that are also associated with SDD tuple. Uh, SDD tuple element uh, holds the, uh, gets a tuple and an element and returns the type of, the, of that element. It is used mostly in the uh, definition of get. Uh, SCD uses allocator, uh, uh, much like any other allocator, uh, uh, so, so, excuse me, much like any other container, SCD tuple can use a custom allocator. Uh, unlike other uh, containers, it doesn't have the definition of allocator in the tuple itself for performance reasons. Uh, and uses allocator is a way to uh, overcome the fact that it doesn't include that definition in the structure itself. Uh, for the store as a tuple, uh, very is somewhat similar to uh, make tuple and time in that it creates a tuple, but it creates a tuple using SDD forward to uh, uh, move uh, elements. And I don't, don't want to discuss that because then we have to discuss uh, the longevity of the of uh, the lifespan of elements, how it affects that. So that is entirely other discussion. Tuple cut allows you to concatenate uh, two tuples. You would think that we would also need a way to take a subset of a tuple, but unfortunately that doesn't exist. 
uh, and there is a, a std ignore which is used in time in case you don't want to uh, assign all the values again this is very high level and i don't want to get into all of details beyond that uh, c plus plus 17 did include some really interesting uh, uh, in, in additions uh, there is some improvement, improvement to the deduction rules. That's, uh, to my opinion, not the most interesting part. But one of the things that, as a Python uh, the developer, you know you can do in, in, uh, with the tuple is to invoke uh, functions because parameters to functions are basically an ordered set of different types of elements, which is what a tuple does. And in C++ 17, we have that ability added to the standard template library. STD apply takes a callable object and call it with the uh, tuple of elements. This is very useful if you want to, uh, for example, create a more generalized callback mechanism. And uh, STD make, make from tuple does the same with the constructors. All right. Uh, so that's a very uh, high level introductory uh, into. Uh, 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 into C++. If I want to, uh, to emphasize the two main things that I think you should take away from this talk is that SD tuple is very useful when replacing uh, very trivial structures. Uh, and it, from my experience, make the code more readable. Uh, there is still, however, a lot of work to, uh, to be done in order to make it really as useful as it is in, say, Python, for example. Uh, right. So uh, that's uh, my uh, introduction into SDT Topol. Thank you very much.